worn down by time. Things get shaky, they crumble, fall apart. So, build it. Build it so you can lay down your head at night, knowing you've done all you can. Build it strong enough to withstand the rain, the flood, and the storm. Build it when the world is uncertain. And nothing is guaranteed. You can build a life that's built to last. Well, good morning. How are you doing this morning? Doing good. Yeah, come on now. A few of us are fired up, but hey, if you're not in the room today and you're joining us on Facebook, we're going live today and we're pretty thrilled about that. And we'd love your help today uh, as you uh, leave today. Uh, make sure and share. And uh, if you're watching online, share and let people know you're joining us this morning live on Facebook. And we're glad and thrilled that you're checking us out. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open them up to the Gospel of John. If you're new to the Bible, just kind of open to the middle. Start turning to your right and you'll see names that look familiar. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you can land in John will be in chapter one in just a few moments. The Wizard of Oz was a movie unlike any other movie in the summer of 1939. There was none like it ever before. Uh, the movie began in a black and white reality and then through a dream, a whole new vivid colorful world of the land of Oz was experienced. Uh, Dorothy was pretty perplexed as to how she landed there and on her journey uh, she had met some friends on this yellow brick road and every single one of these characters in the story all had this thing inside of them. They all longed for something that they had not ever had or ever experienced. They had this hope, they had this longing deep within them and I gotta get this thing, I gotta, this'll, this'll bring true meaning in my life and they couldn't find it in and of themselves, all of them. And so they embarked on this journey, on this yellow brick road uh, to a land called Oz to encounter the wizard. Now they had various obstacles along the way as many of you, if you've seen the movie, you know and if you haven't seen it then your head's probably been in the sand a little bit, it's been around a while and they embarked on their journey and there were several, several, several moments, probably even disastrous moments, but as soon as they finally got into uh, the wizard's inner sanctum, they were met with volume, they were met with, I mean, smoke, lights, lasers, and, and fire, and it was just a lot. It was a lot to be said. And what I find fascinating is that little Toto, Dorothy's dog, jumps out of her hands out and runs over to this particular section in that room and he pulls back that curtain. And what did he find? He found a, a wizard there that was turning cranks and pushing buttons and pulling chains and pulling ropes and creating that mass chaos and hysteria that they were really terrified of. And what's pretty interesting is that it's only when the truth was revealed that they all got what they longed for. It was only when the truth was revealed that they all got what they longed for, when they saw what was actually behind the curtain and met the truth, which was the wizard, that they actually got what they longed for. The scarecrow got his brain. The lion got his courage. The tin man got his heart. And Dorothy, what did she get? She got home. Here's what I'm here to say today is that for all of us, we have this longing inside of every one of us. There's something in there that we all long for, that we hope for, isn't there? Isn't that in your heart or is that just me? And we've all got this thing and I don't know what it is for you and I don't know what it is for me, but we uh, have this longing and what I wanna say today is that this longing can actually be realized for you. You can fill it, you can have this sense of meaning and purpose. And what's interesting is, is that the way in which we receive this actually is pretty counterintuitive. It's not normal how we receive it. It's intuitive because, counterintuitive because it's not a formula that you and I can apply. Like if we do this and this and this, then this happens. It's not really a, a behavior that we can now try, like a new behavior, let me try that. That will then fill me. 
It's not a, uh, something that you and I can even buy, that we can go out to the store, pick that up, and then that then will fulfill us and give us that meaning in our lives. Well, then what is it? What is it? What's this thing that will fill us that we've been talking about for several weeks now, but what in, and we've laid that foundation to get to this moment right here. That thing that can fill us full of meaning and can give us purpose and can uh, give us everlasting joy, it is the awesomeness of the glory of Jesus revealed to you and to me in his church. What I'm here to say is that when you actually see Jesus and we experience him through what, how we just sung, the songs that we sang, worthy is the lamb that was slain. He's so good, he's so awesome, we can't contain it, we sing songs about it, we preach about it. He fills everything that we do. When we see Jesus for who he really is, then that sets a heart on fire for him. And what I would contend is that as he sets on fire your heart and 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 he sets our hearts on fire for him, then he sets our church on fire for him. And then what happens is as we share just how fired up we are about seeing Jesus and him changing our life and restoring relationships, when that happens, people come to watch us burn and experience the fire that you have and that I have and that we have as a church. Now I get it, if you're new to church and you got drug here this morning and you're maybe sitting in the seat of a skeptic and uh, you're thinking, yeah, I, I, you're telling me that Jesus, like I've heard of him, he is the space, like he's gonna fill that void in my heart. That seems a little simple. And what I would say to you is, I appreciate your skepticism, and that is fair. That is so fair. But the truths of Christianity have satisfied the brightest minds in all of the world. And what I would encourage you today with is could you just possibly lean in, not to even what I'm saying, but to the words of a man who actually I witnessed, saw the resurrected Christ and the power of his life and he lived to tell about it and wrote about it and we get to read his words. Could you just lean into that for a moment? In the Gospel of John, John writes a story about, it's not a story, it's not fictional, it's truth. And he accounts what happened to uh, the life of Christ and how he journeyed through the world and impacted people and saved people and transformed people. And in John chapter one and verse 14, he tells us, he gives us the truth, the, the, the glory of Jesus revealed and how that satisfies us and fills us and then propels us forward and what I love about this verse truth be told this is the one verse we're going to study today now I got a couple of other verses we'll pop on the screen for you but this verse is kind of like that bag that Mary Poppins brings to Jane and Michael's house and like it never ends the bottom just you're like are you going to continue to pull more out of that it, it just never stops that's kind of what this verse is like it's like you can't ever dig to the bottom of it because there's so much there so if you have your Bibles, what I wanna do is uh, open them up to John 1. We're gonna read the verse, and if you, if you don't have a copy of God's word, just listen to it first before we break it down. Listen to what John says. He says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the one, or as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He starts off this whole thing with two words, and he says the word. Now, I don't know about you, but the first time I ever read this, I was pretty confused because I'm not like Mr. Grammatical English person, um, but I noticed something that isn't common with the word Word, yeah, yeah, why is the word capitalized? Why, what's that capital W there for? And uh, it goes back to the first verse in John 1. Now, if you have your Bible, you can see it. It says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word, capital, was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. So all of a sudden, now, in this one verse, we hear some powerful truth that this Word isn't like any other word spoken. This Word is a person, and this Word is Jesus. 
John is saying that in the beginning there was Jesus and he was God and he is God and that's who he is and that's a powerful statement. And he says that the word, he continues to say uh, the, uh, this about Jesus, that the word, it, he became, what's that word? Flesh. That he became flesh and he dwelt among us. In, in other words, Jesus became just like you and he became just like me, like he became a human being. Now, if, if you're an inquisitive person, my curiosity is it peaked all the time. I'm a very curious person. And when he, I read these words that this Jesus, who was God, in heaven, and he uh, became flesh and dwelt among us, I, I have to ask the question, why would he do that? Why would Jesus leave perfection and come to earth? That sounds like an awful trade-off. Who's with me on that? That sounds like an awful trade-off. Why would that happen? Well, Jesus, re or God, Jesus, realized that there was something blocking the creation, his humanity between God and his creation. And, and, uh, and so we understand what, that ha what that's like. You've probably had in your marriage, you had an argument and there was a relational blockage. You ever felt that before? Or maybe uh, with a friendship or somebody at school, you didn't know you said something that offended them and then now all of a sudden she's not talking to you or he's not talking to you. That's a relational blockage. We know what that feels like and we wanna do anything we can to make sure that that blockage is no longer there, right? We, we don't want that to happen and God doesn't want that either and so God solved the problem in Jesus and it says in actually 2nd Corinthians verse 5 it'll be on the screen for you for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself now reconciled is not really a word that we use often but he explains what he means in the next part of the verse uh, what was he doing? He was no longer counting people's sin against them. How was he not doing that? Here's how, here's how this unfolds. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin. Here's the key, so that. He did that. He made Christ the offering. Why did he do that? So that we, human beings, could be made right with God through Christ. Y'all, that's powerful. The fact that God looked down from heaven and saw the cinematic moment of human history play before him like a movie and he looked at us and he said, I love you. I love you so much that I will send my one and only son to be the sacrifice for that blockage that we're experiencing right now, that sin, and he'll take that upon himself. And he'll do that willingly because he loves you. Some of you need to hear that today. Maybe you didn't grow up hearing from your, from your father that he loves you. And your heavenly father loves you. Like love, love. Loves you. And that blows me away about me. You wanna know why? Because I know me. And I know my thoughts and I know my actions at times and my propensities and the fact that God would look down on me in spite of all of those things and say, I love you so much that I'll sacrifice everything for you. That blows me away that he would leave heaven for me, that he would leave heaven for us. May we never shake that story. He says that the word became flesh like you. Jesus knew what it truly meant to be human. And then he says, as he came, something changed. Something was different because of him coming. He uses it in the next phrase. He implies that he, so the word became flesh, and then the very next phrase says that he did what? He dwelt, say that. Say it again like you mean it. Okay, so you get it. He dwelt among us. Dwelt like he, he moved in. Uh, the feeling is, uh, let me explain what dwelt, I'll give you two ways. One, what it feels like, and one, what it actually means. What it feels like when he says that he dwelt among us is kind of like this. My, when Sydney, my oldest daughter, now 11, when she was three, um, 
we made birthdays a big deal. That tells you how long ago we made birthdays a big deal. When you got four, you just kind of gets watered down the more that you have. We're lucky to keep them all alive, honestly. And, um, but uh, Sydney, when she was three, uh, you know, we, sell, uh, we had a birthday calendar on the fridge with a countdown calendar. I mean, we shot video of this thing. I couldn't even tell you where the picture of Roman's third birthday is. Like, I don't even know. He's the fourth one. We have no idea. Uh, but here's the thing. We had this countdown to her birthday party, shot video of it. All of the family from both sides come to Nana and Papa's house about an hour and a half away from where we lived. And the whole drive there, man, are we excited? And she gets this, I mean, just like, you know, little three-year-olds get, I mean, they're just, they're overwhelmed with their emotion. And so we built this thing up really, really big. And then when we pull into Nana's driveway and she runs, like she couldn't get her seatbelt unbuckled fast enough. And she runs to the front door and Nana, opens the door and Sydney walks in with those big chubby cheeks that she had and that three-year-old toddler voice it sounds like you got a frog in your throat like it was like she walks in the door with arms wide open like this and says I'm here and stands in the middle of the room and it's as if the party can start because I'm here the reason that we're all gathered today is for little miss Sydney and the Dora birthday party and in the very same way John is saying to you and to me when he says that the word became flesh and he dwelt among us, it's like Jesus making the announcement, I'm here, crank up the music, start the party, let's get this thing moving. It's powerful. It's even more powerful when you know what it literally means. It's the word dwelt, it means tabernacled. Now I couldn't tell you the last time I used that word, actually I could, it was last Sunday, but in normal moments I, uh, nobody uses that word but what it does is it actually draws us back to the old testament in the book of exodus that we studied last week you see god desperately wanted community and connection with his people he wanted that and before he sent jesus he made this thing called the tabernacle and he said in Exodus chapter 25, verse eight, let me, let them, sorry, the people of Israel, make me a sanctuary that I may dwell, same word, in their midst. What's fascinating about living in our modern world is that people have recreated the tabernacle so that you could see it. I wanna show you what it looks like. And uh, this is actually somewhere, I think, in Turkey. And this is what this, this is built to spec what the tabernacle would have potentially looked like. Obviously, these are modern resources in a non-modern era. So you gotta kinda use your imagination a little bit. And one artist uh, drew a rendering of what it would look like when the, the nation of Israel was around it. Look at that, some two million people and this tabernacle would be placed at the center of their camp when they, would, when they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, this tabernacle would be at the center of that and that fire is the very presence of God falling on that place. And when he, the tabernacle used to be the place of scripture. It used to be where the Bible was contained. It was the place of revelation uh, where uh, God would be revealed. It was the place where truth would happen, where the sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins was done. It was the place uh, of forgiveness. It was uh, a place uh, where uh, they would focus their worship. One author said that the tabernacle in the midst, you see it, in the midst of the people served as a vivid sign of the divine presence in the wilderness that was moving with them and leading them into the promised land. And here's what's incredible. Is that now, God doesn't fall on a place on the backside of the desert that you can't go find anymore. God's and his presence and his glory falls on a person. And it falls on his son, Jesus Christ. And so now, it's not a place, but it's a person that we run to for forgiveness because he was the sacrifice. Jesus is the living word and the revelation of God to mankind. Now, Jesus is the uh, focus of our worship, of our attention, and of our affection. And it all changed because he became flesh and he dwelt among us. 
And what makes this so relevant for you and for me? What makes this thing incredibly relevant for us and makes it more real is that you and me, um, by this dwelling among us, it means that Jesus knows what it is like to be fully you. He knows what it's like to be a human being. It means that Jesus is relatable. Did you know that there is no other religion in the known world where God became one of the creation to relate to them? Every other world religion is a quest to get to God and the story of Christianity is God's quest to get to you. Jesus knows what it's like to endure hardship. He understands that the struggle is real. He realizes that what it's like to fall in a moment of weakness, though he never did. He understands just how berating the devil can be in our lives. Temptation, not daily, let's just be real. It's sometimes moment by moment by moment. And he understands that. He he knows what it's like to live this human experience and he gets all of that and it says in Hebrews 4, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are yet he never sinned. Jesus Christ has faced every struggle the human heart has ever faced and never failed. He has faced everything that you you have faced in your life. Do you mean everything? I mean everything. Everything. And what's even more powerful, y'all, is that it's not just about him, his presence falling in glory on that tabernacle and now the glory of Christ revealed to us is powerful, but what's so incredible is that the same power that work in Christ that helped him overcome weakness, overcome temptation and sin, according to John 14, 17, is available to believers because the spirit dwells in us and not in a tabernacle. It dwells in you and that power power and resurrection power and overcoming power is in you. It's not in a place. It is found in the spirit of God inside of every single believer. You need to slap your neighbor and say, I hope you got it. Man, I hope you got it. Because it changes everything. It changes everything. John goes on to say that we have seen his glory. Y'all, I'm already worn out. I'm not even halfway through. We we have seen his glory. (laughs) This is ridiculous. Because he he interrupts his account here and he's telling about Jesus. He's like, y'all, I've seen him. He actually says in 1 John 1, he writes later, uh, that which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon and have touched with our eyes, the life that is made manifest, we've seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you this Jesus. This is not, uh, guys, in the last couple of weeks, if you've tuned in online, we've been up in the air. We've been talking about big topics. Honestly, what scholars call theological constru- constructs. We're, we're getting a theological framework to move forward as we build something on top of what we already have. And uh, it's really up here. And what he's saying is, listen, this is not ethereal. This is not theory. This is not a bunch of people nerding out in a room coming up with a book here. It's not like that. He says, this is real. We saw him with our eyes. We touched him with our hands. We heard his voice. And if you are a skeptic today, listen to the eyewitness testimony of the man who said, I saw him with my own eyes. I experienced his glory firsthand. We have seen his glory. To which I begged John, as if he was right next to me in my office this week, what did you see, man? What did you see? What, 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 what? My brain, you know where it went? Celebrity entourages. Like, does Jesus have an entourage before he walks into the room? This isn't gonna work. 
okay, we right here, Jesus isn't gonna like this and he's not gonna like that and uh, we gotta get the temperature just right. Let's make sure he's got his Skittles. He only likes purple and brown M&Ms. Make sure that's sweet tea because we all know Jesus only drinks sweet tea. If he doesn't like it, it's fine. He'll turn water into wine. It's no big deal, but we just wanna set the stage, make sure he doesn't get a sunburn. I went to P. Diddy. I don't know why, but that's where I went. Does Jesus have an entourage and an umbrella man? That just, like, before he ever walks in a room, he's here, he's here, he's here, he's here. Does he have that? No, we, no, no. Uh, quite the opposite. Jesus is not a celebrity. He was actually hated. He didn't have an entourage like that. So what did he see? Jesus was born to a peasant woman and a carpenter. Dirt under the fingernails. Teenage mother. He basically lived like the peasant for his entire life. His appearance, guys, he did not shop on Rodeo Drive. I mean, he wasn't even Old Navy. His appearance, Isaiah tells us, he's common. Just average. Maybe even looking below average. His friends, they basically were people who were embezzlers, tax collectors, and fishermen, not like the hottest crew to run around with. In every city that he went to, (laughs) prostitutes, sick people, lame, people who didn't, uh, outcasts of society, like listen, the crew he ran around with, your crew's probably cooler than theirs. What did he see? His entire circumstances of his life were in no way ever going to be described when you looked at Jesus as glorious. Nobody would have ever associated Christ and glorious when he walked on this earth when just looking at him. So what did they see? When they saw Jesus, they saw a humility they'd never seen before. They saw a purity of heart like none other. When they looked into his eyes, they saw tender kindness. They saw the way that he treated people. He was compassionate, but yet standing for truth and justice all at the same time. When they looked at Christ, they saw things that they had never seen before. They saw encouragement and forgiveness and courage, availability and attentiveness, even to the littlest of children who would walk up to him. When they looked at him, they saw wisdom. They saw, when they looked into the eyes of Christ, what John would later say in this verse, in verse 14, the only, the glory of the only Son from the Father. What they saw is what the writer of Hebrews would write in Hebrews 1.3. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the power of his word. When John and everybody and the disciples, when they saw Christ, they looked into the very eyes of God. They saw God. Man, lots of people in our world wanna know what God looks like and I would tell you what God looks like is Jesus. He is the face of the Father in heaven. When we see Jesus, we see what God is like. And I've been waiting all week to get all this stuff, all that we've left up in the air and get it on the ground for us and put grit under our fingernails, calluses on our hands and get a little sweat on our brow and say this to you that Jesus is the glory on the ground. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the image of God. Like we've said, wet is to water, like bulb is to light, like heat is to fire, glory is to God, and Jesus is God, the glory of God revealed to you and revealed to me. It gets all that theory out of the air and it puts it right in front of you and right in front of me. He is all that you would ever need. 
He is the glory of God on the ground, face to face, in personality, with eye color, hair color, and with his own body scent. It is Jesus, the glory on the ground, and that fuels the fire of a person who wants to live vertically. And it fuels the fire of a church that wants to be a vertical church. And if that doesn't get you fired up, then your wood is wet. This is what we hope to see every single week in our church, in our services, through our music. Yeah, it's not just about eliciting emotion and getting excited and getting shrills up our spine, but we want to bring Jesus to bear on your heart and mine. We want the glory on the ground to be in this room through what we sing. That's why we sing what we sing. That's why we preach me what I preach what I preach. I want to get truth to your heart that elicits an emotion that gets to your heart and calls us to follow Christ, calls us to repent and lay our lives before him. That's what we wanna see in our lobby and at our cafe and greeting you at the door and all throughout our ministries. We want to lift up the powerful life-changing presence of Jesus in and through this church. We want it to be a resounding gong when we leave this place that echoes in our ears all week long, longing to be back into God's house and to experience the glory on the ground in this moment through what we're doing. but what does that even look like? Like in a very real way. John tells us. We don't have to make it up. We don't have to have a strategy meeting because he gives it to us. And he tells us right here that when they looked at Jesus, the very last phrase, they saw the glory of Jesus, what does it say? Full of grace and truth. When they saw Jesus, they saw a man full of grace and full of truth. Can I tell you how awesome this is? Write this down. Hold on, don't, before you write it down, just hear me. Has anybody ever said you're full of it? (laughs) Have they, to you? Positive or negative? Mostly negative, right. If anybody's ever said, man, you're full of it, you're like, whoa, full of what? And then you just probably walk away because you don't want to hear what they think you're full of. This is positive. Jot this down. Jesus is full of grace. He's full of grace. And grace is God's, hear me, God's movement towards you, motivated by his love. Grace is God's movement, his love for you and for me. And Jesus is so full of this grace that it overflows. Like a, like a 14-year-old carrying a five-gallon bucket full of water, you can't help but spill it, right? That's how Jesus is. He's like a 14-year-old carrying a bucket, a five-gallon bucket of water full of water, and everybody's like, don't spill, don't spill. And he's like, oh, I'm all about spilling, man. Let's move this thing. And he's overflowing, sloshing over towards you and towards me with grace, meeting us at our deepest moment of need, hear me, and he snatches us from the hands of sin. That's what his grace does. He picks us up in the moment where we blew it the most and he meets us in that moment and his grace never runs out. Somebody needs to hear this today. There are no grace rations with Jesus. There are no grace rations with Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus doesn't have to have a backstock. He's not having to go back to the cupboard and go grab more in his, who he is, he's full of grace. He's full of it and he's sloshing over for the one who feels that their sin is too dark, their shame is too real, the cycle is too tough to break. There is enough grace right for you, right for you, right now, right now. There's grace for you right now. God is reaching towards you through the person of Christ, reaching down and saying, listen, it's okay not to be okay. It's okay not to be okay. Let me just reach down and meet you where you are and your faith is your hand reaching up to God and believing that that grace is really for you.
It is awesome. Full of grace. And that's what I want us to be. When people walk in this door, I want them to sense the magnitude that God's grace is meeting them right where they are in their moment of their deepest need. Place of grace. A place where it's okay not to be okay. Because if we're all honest, we're probably all not okay. But when you get Jesus, you get grace. And that's great news. But you also get truth. If grace says it's okay not to be okay, then when you get Jesus, you get truth, and he's full of truth. He's full of grace and full of truth. What that says is it's okay not to be okay. That's grace. But it's not okay to stay that way. That's truth. What you get when you get Christ is truth. Later in the Gospel of John, Jesus would say of himself, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through me. And that's truth. He says that I am the way. I am the way to life. I am the way to everything that you would ever need. I am the way to a changed heart, the freedom from hurt, the everlasting joy, the way to unending peace and total transformation. I am the way to heaven. I'm the way. And I am the truth. The truth. The truth about how God feels about you and how he feels about me. The truth that he looks at you and he's not put off by how he sees you today, but he's moving towards you because he loves you. He loves you. The truth about not just how he feels about you, but who you are. You aren't what has been done to you. You are not what you have done or what you're doing in this moment. You are, by receiving the grace of God meeting you where you are, you are forgiven, you are redeemed, and you are set on fire to burn for him for your life. And you are who God says you are. The truth about what he's doing in his church Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus says, I will build my church. Now that'd be pretty egotistical if I was saying that. But Jesus is not an egomaniac. He is God in the flesh and he can say whatever he wants. And he's got a mission. And he says, Jesus is saying this, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In other words, Jesus is building his church. He is the architect with the dream and with the plans in the specific way that he wants that thing going, but he's not just the dreamer, he's also the one with the hammer and with the two by fours and with the exact moment that uh, what you need to do, when you need to do it. He is the architect, the dreamer, and he is the executor. And listen, he's saying that as I am building my church through you, through me, it was ultimately through Peter is where it all started, through us, he's saying, listen, nothing will stop stop Jesus from building his church. No devil, no person, no place, no thing, no weird economic slip, no matter who's in the White House or not, no matter who gets elected or not, no matter what legislation is passed, Jesus is saying, listen, there's a building program going on and it's building the kingdom of God through the local church and I will build my church. And I just want to contend that we should let him do it. I think we should let him do it. I think we should let him have his way with us. Y'all, what if, what if this worked? Like, like what, what, what if we just let him build his church and we were just vessels? Like, what if, I, I, I can't, I, I've been trying to figure this out for three weeks. I can't figure out what's, if there's anything wrong with making your church, our church, all about revealing Jesus in everything we do. 
Like I can't come up with a logical pushback to, well, we can't make it about Jesus. Like that just seems ridiculous. Like we make songs about Jesus and we preach about Jesus and like our kids, they, they, about Jesus? That's irrational. I can't come up with a logical reason why we couldn't do this and make that the rhythm that we all align to. Because when we make it about Jesus, you no longer see me. And you no longer see what we sing, the way we sing it, the programs, the lack thereof programs. And you're just marching to that beat that this is about Jesus. This is about Jesus. I wish Teddy was here to lay down a good beat for me right now. We're just in sync. We're in sync with Jesus. That's the, this is not an indictment. This is just, this is what, I, I, can't, I can't figure it out what else makes sense. So what if this worked? What if you and I just rallied around this and we shared with our friends, man, what you're gonna get when you come to sunrise is a place of grace and a place of truth to the heart of people. And really, we're all about Jesus. I'm not saying that other churches aren't about Jesus. I'm just saying I can't, I'm not responsible for any other church. But I'm responsible for us. And what if we rallied around this? What could happen? I'll tell you what'll happen. The universal longing in every single human heart in this city, there has been made a provision for that longing and it is God's very presence revealed in Jesus Christ. That is the only play we have to meet that longing. And so your kids and my kids, our neighbors, the people we work with, their soul will be anchored in the reality that Jesus is every single thing you long for and hope for and stokes the fire of passion in your heart. And the person that gets that and shares that and the church that rallies around that is set on fire and people will come watch it burn. Father, we come to you today and we recognize that uh, you are good and you've heard the cry of our heart. It's very clear that this is what your people want here at Sunrise and we are with rhythm, step, 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 in step with your presence. God, may we be obedient, humble followers that we just wanna love you and follow you. Still praying today. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. Can I get this really personal for you today? What if you've never, because of your skepticism, truly embraced the grace of God and the truth that Jesus is the only way? What if you've never done that? What if you've never called on Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior, ever? And you've never embraced Jesus full of grace and full of truth? but what if that changed for you today right now? Like what would happen if you embraced Jesus as grace and truth in your life as your savior? What, what would happen? Well, that longing that you have, that I have, that we've all had, my guess is if you lean into Christ and you accept him into your life, I don't have to guess, I know because I've done it. That longing, it gets filled. It gets filled with Jesus. And you get purpose. And he begins to unload a plan for you in your life. And you've got a place to belong in his church. A community to rally around you, to support you, and to help you follow Jesus as best as we can. So in your skepticism, could I ask you this question? What if, I know what you're thinking, well, what if you're wrong? I've given my entire life to this. And many people who have gone before me have done the very same thing. Can I ask you a question? What if you're wrong? What if it is true? 
What if he really is full of grace and really is full of truth and he really can save you and set you free and give your life everlasting joy and peace and transformation that you've never experienced before? I'm here to tell you it works. But you gotta believe it. And I wanna give you an opportunity right now to say, you know what? I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired and I wanna embrace Christ full of grace, full of truth in my life right now. And all you have to do is something very simple. Admit that your way isn't working and that you're a sinner and that Jesus died and rose again to save you from your sin. And confess him, your Lord. And the way we like to confess him around here is just with a simple raise of a hand. If you've never done that today, would you raise your hand and just say, I'm embracing Christ full of grace and full of truth. I've never done this before and I want to embrace him right now. Online today, if you're making that decision, just simply tell us in that comment, I am giving my life to Christ. Be that clear. I'm giving my life to Christ today. I'm giving my life to Christ. Embracing him full of grace and full of truth. I got your hand, ma'am, right over here on my left, your right. I got you. More importantly, not do I got you, but God's got you. He loves you. His grace is meeting you where you're at. I don't know where you're at, but the truth is he loves you and he sent his son for you and now you have everlasting life. Who else? Full of grace, full of truth. I want to embrace Christ by faith. What a holy moment. What we're going to do in this moment, for those of you that made a decision online or in this room, what I want you to do, if you didn't have the courage to raise your hand, it really is just you confessing to God and I'm gonna pray and you just say something like I'm saying. My words aren't powerful. It's your obedient heart that makes all the difference. Heavenly Father, you can repeat after me in the stillness of your heart. I admit that I'm a sinner and I believe that Jesus is my savior right now and that his grace is meeting me right where I'm at. And today I realize that it's okay not to be okay. But the truth of Jesus is that it's not okay to stay that way. So I've got to give my life to you. I confess you as Lord. I confess you as Savior. Save me and change me. Father, you are amazing to us. The fact that you look down on us and <laughs> still use us and still move, with, move in with, with us and around us is powerful. And God, what we want to do now as a prayer in this moment is we want to lift up an anthem to you. Our hearts cry to you is that you really are all to us. You really are the precious cornerstone. You are everything for us. And today we sing this over our heart. We sing it over our lives as a declaration and prayer to you. May it be so forever that we as a body of believers, a family of God called Sunrise, you are all to us.